Um, so um, I'm Rosaline Duffy, um, and um, I've organised this panel on militarisation. Um, and I'm part of this project, or I lead this project called um, Biosec. And what we're doing is we are exploring the integration of biodiversity conservation with security logics, particularly using um, illegal wildlife trade as an example to explore those interrelationships. And one of the themes of our work is examining the different forms of militarization of conservation. Because while there's a lot of focus on what's the effect of illegal wildlife trade on wildlife populations, one of the things we're interested in is what's the effect of the responses to the illegal wildlife trade on both uh, human and animal communities as well. So we're looking at kind of the, res the policy response. Um, and what ways that kind of plays out. So I think for us, or for me, um, conservation is changing um, as a result of this debate, and it's becoming harder and harder to distinguish between conservationists and the people and practices we normally find in the security sector. And in the Biosec projects, we're exploring why this has happened, how it's happened, and ultimately we aim to understand what this means for the future direction of wildlife conservation. And these are new directions with uh, conservationists partnering with private military intelligence or security analysts um, with very large defence contractors like Northrop Grumman in the US or Paramount Group in South Africa and also partnering with standing armies. Um, but it's not all spectacular stuff either. It can be the very kind of silent, imperceptible means by which security logics are working their way into conservation and ways in which conservation then can be used to trial new techniques for future warfare. That's another area that we're interested in. So um, one example of that is the ways that conservation might be being used to market uh, new products at weapons fairs around the world so that uh, weapons manufacturers are increasingly talking about their engagement with conservation. Um, and we want to look at that and, because in many ways this is becoming more and more everyday, more and more normalized and therefore more and more difficult to raise those counter-arguments which are really critical. And in moments of urgency like this around the illegal wildlife trade, it's very tempting to lock down on and hone in on uh, existing approaches, to rush uh, to the assumption that there's a need to aggressively defend wildlife. But we need to ask who are we defending that wildlife against and in what ways? And what will this mean for the future options available to conservationists? So in this panel, we've got three excellent speakers. Uh, first, uh, uh, Bram Buscher will speak from the University of Wageningen, who has extensive research experience um, on sa in South Africa and has seen at first hand how the deployment of force in Kruger National Park um, is changing the face of conservation there. And second, we have Charles Jones and Kali, um, who will explain how militarisation is regarded and experienced by BACA communities. And finally, I'll turn to um, Jasper Humphreys, who's from the Marjan Centre at King's College London, who has a long-standing background in war studies and will unpick the meanings um, of uh, militarisation. So the intention of this panel is to kind of uh, challenge, um, to pro provoke and to encourage thinking um, about the wider implications of militarisation in conservation. So I'll pass over to Bram now, who'll be our first speaker, and we'll have, uh, sorry. We'll have um, each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, um, so then the second half of the session will be open for question and answer. So. Thank you very much, Rosaline. Uh, it's a delight to be here. Uh, so I only have 10 minutes, and I was asked to provoke. So I can't go into any details, so basically that's my main aim. Just want to get some really broad ideas out there, just to challenge maybe a couple of sort of ingrained ways of thinking, perhaps not necessarily for, for this audience, but, but more generally. And certainly also, I think, a little bit what we heard uh, this morning. Um, and then in the debate, hopefully we can um, uh, get into some more details. Um, so I've titled the presentation from Green Wars to Convivial Conservation. It's basically based on two projects that I'm currently engaged in. One is a, what I call crisis conservation, uh, how conservation increasingly is in a sort of a crisis mode. And we're trying to understand, or at least with case studies in Indonesia, South Africa, and Brazil, trying to understand responses to militarization uh, of conservation. Um, and my own role in that is a more sort of a more overarching conceptualization. And we've started to think about some of that, and I will talk about that here as well. That relates to the Green Wars concept. 
Um, the other concept uh, towards convivial conservation is another project that I'm uh, sort of finalizing. Uh, it's actually a book project. The book is uh, done, but it was basically a response uh, to many, I think, of us who have been critical about certain ideas around conservation and all that. Like, what is the answer? What is the solution? Um, well, none of us have the solution in mind, but that at least is our attempt to come up with some kind of idea of where we might go from there. And again, I can't, there's something really, yeah. is it my phone or it's not on? But is that better? That's better. That's better, okay. Then it is my phone. See, oh, Google is tracking you regardless, right? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do, even if it's off. Um, so that, that was basically uh, my and a colleague, uh, Rob Fletcher's response to, to, the, to these questions. Um, I can't go into any detail there either, um, but basically uh, a lot of what the keynote speaker said this morning I think was very interesting, but if you take the opposite, that's kind of what we are saying in the book. So it has to be political, you have to be active, right? Very, very active, right? And that doesn't mean you don't do good science, right? Science is always political. You can separate the two to a degree, but never fully, right? So we start from that basis, right? Activism is always seen as, you know, if you, if you, if you come out for the greater good, things like conservation, poverty reduction, gender equality, etc., you're sort of political. But when you help private companies, you know, get more money, then you're supposed to do value creation, at least in my university, that's what it's called. Um, I take the exact opposite approach. So that's, that gives you a little bit of background to where we're, where we're going with that project. Um, just starting out with this idea of green wars, so all very generic, but what we're trying to sort of get at with this concept is uh, a worrying sort of spiral of violence that, that, that we are seeing in many parts of the world, right? particularly in Kruger, where I've done a lot of work myself, but more broadly in terms of intensification of dynamics around wildlife crime, but also resource extraction, land conversion, many others, which have a lot of violent effects on, on nature. And I'm not just talking like violence in terms of wildlife crime only, but sort of the slow type of violence that we see as well, right? The, 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 the degradation of ecosystems and all the rest of that. Increasingly, as a response to that, we see a violent defense of nature so as to ensure its conservation and preservation, right? And if you sort of add those two things up, right? What we're seeing, at least what we're sort of fearing, and, uh, is, is, you know, green wars as a sort of new 21st century realpolitik, in, in, in good German, right? Of a negative spiral of violence and conflict in environmental conservation. And this is what we see literally on the ground. And I think my, my, my colleagues will be saying more about that uh, in their presentations. Um, but for us, this has two elements, and that's what we build on with this convivial conservation ID. On the one hand, uh, yes, a more direct sort of <coughs> militarization of conservation, what I've started calling green violence, including increasing focus on preemption, something that I've increasingly been interested in, where the tools of the war on terror, right, preempting you know, terrorism, are increasingly also related to, uh, to the conservation field. So this has been my, my most recent studies, at least in and around uh, the Kruger, right? particularly using a lot of high tech, right? tech for wildlife. I think there was a, a thing here before this uh, conference, actually. Social media, et cetera. So this is the stuff that I think we know. Uh, but more indirectly, and this is what I've been working on for the last sort of 20 years or so, is market-based forms of conservation. And uh, increasingly, I've become, I've become convinced that that is also not the answer we should be uh, looking for. Right? It's sort of trying to harness the logic that got us into trouble in the first place to try to get us out. And uh, most of our studies are showing that it actually has the, not just, I mean, it can have some positive effects. I'm not saying, I'm not denying that whatsoever. In fact, I put it on my slide. Right? They might have positive local effects at times. Right? There's no blanket black or white here, even though you know, trying to be sl slightly polemic here, but, but there's no black and white in practice. The thing is that these two will not relinquish the overall sort of pressure on biodiversity, and in fact will do quite the opposite. And that's where we come to this idea of a broader sort of intensification of pressures that we see all around us, not just on us as people. We see this in academia as well but on our natural ecosystems, right? So green wars for us then are the material symbolic and a sort of political expression of a global capitalist political economy 
that should be seen or conceptualized as a highly uneven yet systemic pressure cooker, right? And it's always, violence has always been part of that, and of course market-based tools also. And to use those things as the answer to the problems that we're seeing now, right, reinforces the very logic that it's a problem in the first place, right? So that, that, that they are increasingly, I think, part of the problem rather than the solution, and hence, that's why we need to think beyond that, right? They're also part of a sort of a defense, defensive mechanism, right? The defense of wildlife, defense of ecosystem. And again, that's necessary to a really important degree. And I'm not saying we should stop all of that. But at the same time, that's why we, where we come with the book. We also feel that we need to get into a more offensive mode, right? A more political mode, a more um, activist mode next, you know, in our science, next to our science, and through our science. And this is where we come up with the, well, our, our idea is at least an idea, you know, this concept of convivial conservation. Um, and we you know, I can't possibly lay it all out here, but some brief notes, right? It is, it, it, you know, for us, this is an intertwined strategy beyond markets and beyond the strict focus on protected areas, not to get rid of them all immediately, but against sort of this half earth idea that if we retreat into nature needs half, half earth, then we can somehow stop biodiversity loss. We actually don't think so. Protected areas are important in an important way, but right, they need to be part of a much broader sort of strategy to develop inclusive landscapes and inclusive political economies, right? So both on the concrete level and on a more abstract political economic level, right? In the short term and in the long term. So what we really push for is that short term, right, defensive strategies come together with longer term action for broader political economic change. Right? And a lot of people and organizations are already doing that. You, you see them more now in all kinds of ways from donut economics to degrowth, um, the ICCA, uh, Indigenous and Community Conserved Areas Consortium, and many, many more. So we see this as part of that broader sort of stream to try to, on the short term, uh, do what we need to do in order to find a better balance between people's livelihoods and the conservation of species, but over the longer term push for more radical systemic change. Right? So in the project in particular, we're trying to look at four, um, so attached to this book is a, is, a, is, a, is a big project that we got some money for, uh, looking at predator, human predator relations in these, in these places. So if anybody's interested to um, um, collaborate on that, you're very, very welcome. Uh, we are very keen to hear from, you know, all different uh, sorts of stakeholders, and the uh, website is convivialconservation.com. Thank you very much.